And it's a tremendous privilege to have such a voice and such a person, an exemplary person. This is not reading off of a bio. Um, Rabbi Yaakov Horowitz is an Orthodox rabbi and he is a voice of leadership. He's a voice of sensitivity. He's a voice of, of wisdom and more than being a voice, he also has his ear to what's going on. He has his ear to what's current and what matters and what people are going through. And uh, although he'll tell you a thousand times up and down, he's not a therapist. He is certainly a healing force and a force of good and a force of light in a time and in a world that needs so much of it. So along with so many others, it's a treat and a privilege. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Ori, it's my greatest pleasure. Really, my greatest pleasure. It's an honor to be here with you. And I, I hope that, you know, the time is helpful for the most important folks, the ones who are listening and the ones who are struggling with uh, stuttering of any sorts, loved ones, friends, and just general, you know, I, I think perhaps most importantly, um, to some degree, the people in the audience who don't have a loved one who's stuttering, who don't, who aren't personally affected by it because those people are already in the game, as we say, but I think the vast majority of people, that's who I really would encourage to listen to this carefully and, and, and have takeaway lessons, uh, the people who aren't directly affected by it, but do come across from time to time, someone who stutters. What do you do? What do you say? Um, how can you be most supportive? Um, you know, I was at a golf outing yesterday, Uri, and... Um, Did you get the hole in one? Oh, I you was... saw the post? <laughs> no, I didn't. I actually I had a few really good mid you know approach shots that were seriously a foot or two away, but not in that hole. It was, it's you know it's like it's like stuttering. I, I was rooting for you because I could only imagine how many more books you could publish if you had won the hole in one hundred thousand <laughs> dollar shot. We'll Thank get you. to that a little bit later. Thank you, but it's interesting. You know, golf. I, I've always felt that golf is such a good lesson for so many areas of life. And, and one of them is that when, you, when you're playing by yourself and you don't care who's watching you, you usually do a lot better than when, when there's a $100,000 prize on. So the other holes on the average, I did much, I, I was hitting much, uh, much more on the game than that hole. I think stuttering is, is a perfect example that, you know, when you think about it, it becomes m uh, more of an issue. And the more people around you make you comfortable as you are, um, it, it, it enables you to, um, you know, to, to be able to, to function better. And I think that's probably the most important takeaway message for the general population is, is you know, to, to be accepting and encouraging and, and helping. You know, it, it's interesting. I, I, of course, we'll get to it. I, I did stutter as a child. Um, I had let's a just, Let's just jump. Let's just jump right into Go it. For it but please. I just for those that are commenting already, there's my good friend Adam in upstate New York. He says, what did I miss? So I'll just do the intro because truly we have the privilege with someone here today who needs no introduction. And later this week, I have the privilege with Dr. Scott Yaris, my good friend, who also needs no introduction, but introductions are important for context for those that don't know how special you are and what a privilege it is to hear what you have to say. Rabbi Horowitz is the founding dean of Muncie's Yeshiva Darche Noam. Uh, he's a director of the Center for Jewish Family Life. He conducts child abuse prevention and parenting workshops internationally. He's the author of two books. Uh, I think that's incorrect and needs to be updated, but this was handed to me by his publicist. Um, I have those books here and I want to show them to you because one of them is one of the most important books in my family library, and I'll tell you why. It's for everybody. His landmark book on children's personal safety is a picture book for children. Let's stay safe. Um, it's an incredible book. Here it is. And this is a book to talk to children about how to know about the different kinds of touch that are okay, different types of touch that are not okay, and everything in between and how to have those crucial conversations and not avoid the elephant in the room and keep all children safe wherever they may be. Uh, not wait for the problems to come, but really be proactive and this is a, a, a cause that Rabbi Horowitz is a champion and really an advocate and ahead of his times and someone who we need to hear more from on this. And this book is in Hebrew, it's in English, it's in Yiddish. He's also published most recently and actually sold out, if I'm not mistaken, on Amazon, uh, A Bright Beginnings, a book on education in learning the Chumash, which is the Torah, uh, for children to have facilitating educational materials and for teachers and educators around the world, as well as something to facilitate educational material for learning the Talmud, learning the Gemara. And so he's a person who's steeped in Torah wisdom and Torah education, but also 
as I said, really has his head, his eyes, his ears, and his heart on the ground. Um, and he received a very prestigious award called the Covenant Award in 2008, which is a recognition for his contribution to Jewish education. I'll tell you, everyone can notice a funny thing. You'll notice my pronunciation of things shifts as I have this conversation. I'm like a chameleon. And when I, when I talk to people in the tribe, I sometimes take on a more Jewish New York pronunciation of things. And the funniest thing is I had a chavrusa, a study partner from Montreal. Yeah. After I would learn with him, eh, I would start talking like a Canadian. And one of my best friends growing up, Seth Bronstein, and one of my best friends today, Mo Mernick, both people who stutter, after I would hang out with them, my wife always knew I had had a conversation with them because in, a, in my affinity for them, in a complimentary way, I took on some of their uh, stuttering, which is an interesting phenomenon that happens. It's not that I started stuttering, but... Uh, whatever it is, however you want to understand it. It wasn't a stuttering experience, but the rhythm and cadence of my speech took on their, their cadence. So his most recent book, I just want to say, is The Bright Beginnings, A. Lumetzius book. It's available on Amazon. Just want to put that out there. And with that, I'll make one plug for my friend Mo Mernick's book, very special book called The Gift of Stuttering, also available, if not sold out on Amazon. Unbelievable. And I see we have Stu Schnee, uh, posting comments on the bottom of the live feed. So for anyone that just logged on, you're all caught up. So what most people don't know and is not on the bio, and there was a whole conversation behind the scenes, which I'll let Rabbi Horowitz reflect on, is how to say recently Rabbi Horowitz had some videos that he was preparing for very large audiences. He provides Torah lectures and inspiration for people literally around the world. And in recording the lecture, he had a stuttering moment. And rather than editing it out, he chose to put it out, that very clip, as a, as a token of his authenticity and as something that might be helpful to others. So maybe that moment is what brought us together. Maybe you could just share about the journey from being a kid and what it was like as a kid to the, to the present day and, and the choice to share that little clip. So I guess I'll start backwards. I'm a contrarian, so <laughs> just, just you know, from, that, from that moment. It's a Jewish uh, conversation. There you go. <clears throat> so I was recording this. There's a, a Yeshiva Takotel, a very large school in Israel uh, with the worldwide reach. Um, had a, a, the day before Shavuot, one of the holiday when we celebrate the, God giving us the, the Torah. Um, so during that time, the, the Yeshiva Takotel has a worldwide program. They have about 30, 40, 50 speakers chief rabbis you know, of Israel and uh, South Africa, John Merritt. And I was on the program and I was recording this speech and I had a terrible stutter. Honestly, probably the worst I've had in 10, 20 years. And it was part of a 27 minute video. <clears throat> Not only did I publish that clip, I put up that little 58 second clip of the stutter, but I left the stutter in the speech that went to everywhere. Um, and I, I just thought of it because, you know, I had a flashback to a moment uh, at teaching. I started my teaching career at age 22. Um, I volunteered because I was a school was very difficult for me. I was, uh, um, you know, I wasn't much of a student as a, as a preteen and teen. Uh, I volunteered for the weakest track of the school. And one day during a lesson, I was giving a Talmud lesson. And I had a, a mild stuttering moment. And just off the cuff, I said, kids, I'm sorry, I was focusing on the Talmud section of it. It was a difficult, intricate piece of Talmud. And I stuttered a bit. And I, I just as a throwaway line, I, I had never said this before to any of my students. It was the first or second year I was teaching. I said, kids, sorry about that stutter. I started as a kid. I went to therapy. Um, you know, I got over it, thank God. But you'll see sometimes during the year when I get into Gemara, I'll struggle for a word or two, as I'm sure you've noticed in the last little, you know, few minutes of my talk. Um, and that was it. It's just 10 o'clock in the morning. My students got home from school about a quarter to six. And that's when my phone started ringing. And parents were calling me, thanking me for sharing this with the kid. Wow. And it was such a transformational moment for me. First of all, to realize the power of my words to my students, how careful I have to be with what I say and how much encouragement you can give with this. And what 
numerous parents described, probably got called from half the parents of the class. Wow. And what they described was the kids bursting through the door eight hours later saying, mom, mom, you know, dad, Rebbe stuttered. He went for therapy. And I was, you know, I said, oh my God. And then naturally I started accidentally mentioning it to every class, of course, you know, after that. But that's what flashed to me when, when I did that stutter there after the talk and I was listening to it, edit, don't edit, edit, don't edit. I said, what the heck, leave it in. Um, so I, you know, I was, I was um, just by way of, of background, I'm 61 years old. I was, I was born in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. We moved to Bell Harbor, uh, Queens when I was um, about nine years old. Uh, my dad died when I was, for my fourth birthday, my mom remarried two years later. Um, other than that, really unremarkable childhood. Um, thank God my, my parents had, you know, my, my biological mom and my stepdad, we didn't use the word step in our house, had the most amazing marriage and, and just hat tip to both of them. And, um, you know, I, this restless nature and the energy that gets all those books published and stuff, you know, and thinking out of the box and speaking about child sex abuse to audiences that don't want to naturally hear about it. You know, that whole package doesn't really do well when you're 11 and 12 years old in class. And it, it manifests differently. You get yourself into other things. <laughs> right, that's what I'm saying, right, right. You know, if you, you don't care what people think about you, right, and you speak your truth and you're, you have boundless energy, like not really, you know, sitting in the Talmud class for two hours. So, you know, I always had, I had, um, I guess, an understanding of and, and a, a desire to help um, students who were struggling. I was halfway through college pre-med. I wanted to be an oral surgeon. Sore subject with my mom till her dying day. <laughs> I was dating my well, wife. It was, it was a subliminal desire to fix mouths. Yeah, very good. Very good. Already very good. So, so you know, um, I just... I fell in love with teaching and education. And since then, you know, I've just tried to, to reach people on an educational level and also to advocate for people with broken wings of any sort, you know, who needed support. And, you know, it, it is remarkable. You wrote in one of your posts, sorry, you know, who was the first rabbi who stuttered. If you notice the Torah, um, the Bible didn't airbrush out the weaknesses of our greatest leaders. Um, they could just as easily left at the fact that Moses stuttered, right? Moshe Rabbeinu and, and other, you know, that, that our, our, our patriarchs and matriarchs that dealt with uh, challenging kids and dealt with, with the vicissitudes of life and their own struggles. I think that's the real world. That's what we should be doing. Um, the Torah gave us our Bible gave us the, the roadmap of how we should conduct our lives, realize that we have stuff. And great people aren't people who don't have stuff. It's, they overcame their stuff, their issues, and, their, and the, the, it made them great. Incredible. Incredible. So growing up uh, where you grew up, and, and you talked about having boundless energy and and I would say, I, you know, I can share the story. It's funny, I was, I was on the phone with a parent this week and they told me about their husband started off in such and such school and then changed to this school. I said, oh, I had the opposite path. I was in, outside the principal's office a little too often these years. And then I had to switch to this school and then accidentally ended up in this high school. And I also had thoughts, maybe I would be a doctor, maybe I'd be a, a lawyer. And thankfully my father, Avi Amori, uh, Gadol Hador, the giant of the generation in speech therapy, blazed a path and planted a seed in my head. So when I chose to go for speech therapy because I couldn't sit tight for the years of medical school, but speech therapy gave me a path which I couldn't be happier for. Uh, thankfully, you know, for a man, for a Jewish man, it's not necessarily the most common path, but I encourage anyone that, that wants to go down it to go there. And I want to give a shout out to my favorite friend, uh, Moishi Schwartz, who I met a young man who stutters from Flatbush um, when he was 14, came to Queens and we met then. I danced at his wedding uh, just a few years ago and, uh, and I've watched him go through and he's now having his virtual graduation from speech pathology school. He's become a speech wow. language pathologist. So whether you think it's uh, something you can do if it's in you and it feels like your path, you know, go for it. But 
What's interesting is you talked about the academic profile, but tell us a little bit, what was your stutter like? Was it a prominent part of your experience? Did you experience either your own frustration inside or did people make sure to remind you that you were stuttering and give you a hard time about it or wasn't really a big deal? So, so I would say, you know, on a scale of one to 10, it was probably a two or a three. So you weren't very good at stuttering. It was mild. <laughs> I was underachieving stutterer, right, right. No, so like, you know, I stuttered a bit from time to time. Um, and, you know, parents, it, I, I, I could just think of one brilliant thing that my mom did um, that I really would encourage parents to think about. Um, she, she was very... Um, she was casual about it. Like she told me, it, again, it did not, it, you didn't notice it right away. And it, it, it didn't, it really didn't uh, um, affect my ability to function. Uh, sitting still in class was harder than, you know, the stutter part. But she, she told me once, she said, and this was 50 years ago when therapy wasn't so, a therapy of any sort. And she said, listen, Yankee, um, if you want to go for help, if, it, if this becomes an issue to you and you'd like to deal with it, I'll be glad to take you to a therapist. I'll be glad to pay for it. You have to want to do it. So, wow. I'm sorry. Wow. So ahead of her times, you know, that was such an, I, I look back on it, you know, looking at the child in me, you know, I, I, I think it was remorse. She handled it so wise and, and, my what age were you? What age do you remember this happening? 10, 11, I'd say probably. And then I wasn't ready. And I said, okay, mom. And then all of a sudden, I guess, I assume I probably had, a, I don't even, rem I don't remember the details, but I assumed that I had a stuttering experience and I got fed up and I said, okay, mom, I'm ready. Hmm. And it was not a few months after that. It was a while after that, you know, and, and it just... I was ready and she said, okay. And she took me mm -hmm. to, um, she took me to a therapist. We, we, we did speech therapy. I really, honestly, I don't remember the nuts and bolts of what I was told. Um, if you asked me how to help someone who stutters, even if I remembered everything, I would never do that. I am so careful to stay in my lane. I think my lane as a rabbi, as a advocate for children, as an educator, it's, I, I see my role in child abuse education and in, in, in stuttering, anything dealing with people who have a depression or other, other mental health issues is to say, number one, stuff is normal. We all have our, our challenges. Number two, go to an excellent professional who's credentialed. I never do therapy, even in the areas that I like, that I think I'm pretty knowledgeable about, right. like dealing with abuse victims or other things like that. I coach them, I mentor them as best I can, I try to give them good advice, and I send them off. I never, ever get in that lane. And parents, don't. I really, really, really encourage you, don't go to people who are great at doing this. Make sure there's something on the wall that has a degree on it. Because Jews, Jews love to talk. And, and Jews tell other Jewish people, just as other people tell other people, but because we're a tight community, word of mouth travels quickly. So right. someone has a great experience with this vitamin or this thing. People always ask me, what do I say about hypnosis? Or what do I say about different uh, supplements or different things? I say, look, I can't tell you to spend your dollars and your time. I also can't argue with success. If it worked for you, then I'm not gonna tell you not to do it, but I would never tell someone to go. When it comes to speech therapy, on the one hand, there's a lot of frustration with the field because not everyone has a good experience. There are a lot of people that feel burnt out from bad experiences with speech therapy. They feel like it's a bunch of old stuff, boring stuff that doesn't really translate into real life. And so I think based on that, people start looking at things which if they were in their right mind, if they were in their best state, they wouldn't, they wouldn't go to uh, somebody who had a heart attack and got better and go to him to be their cardiologist. So there is something. I was just going to say that, right. There is something to be said. So I guess uh, that is an important point, especially in our community, but around the country. And that's where our field, the profession and the state licenses are important to make sure that the people 
doing services have the training and credentials to do that. And those that put in the time for those credentials did it for a reason. And the Moishi Schwartzes of the world and so many other colleagues of mine, uh, I don't want to name some of them, but there are some exceptional women who stutter who became speech pathologists. There are some exceptional men who stutter who became speech pathologists in our community and, and all around. And there are many places to get good health. Wherever you are, you're not alone. And I also just want to make a quick plug Moishi Rosenberg, who now lives in Lakewood and is a very successful salesman in, I'm going to get it wrong, but I'm going to try, healthcare and nursing supplies. You can find him on LinkedIn, Moishi Rosenberg, a couple of years ago started the Jewish Stuttering Association, uh, which was, yeah, a self-help community specifically for the cultural needs and cultural flavors of the Jewish community. Certainly we at Schneider Speech try to be especially tuned in uh, with all the therapists that work with us, those that are from the tribe and those that are allies of the tribe, um, just as we are allies to others, uh, to be sensitive to issues of, of gender and issues of modesty and so on and so forth. But a shout out to him. But there's also, I just want to share for everybody listening, something called the National Stuttering Association. It's a national organization. And there's actually a WhatsApp group of the kosher, the kosher people uh, within that community, so National Studying Association and so many others. You can look around, you're not alone. Support is so important. And if you're looking for professional help, there is help out there and we can be in touch after this, but uh, that's a really good point. But I wanna go back to what you said about your mom and you were saying, you don't remember what you did in therapy. My father has conducted interviews with hundreds of people and the best of those were the ones that we, we were forced to cut it down. So there's many on the cutting room floor and that's my Yerusha all these cutting room floor videotapes and interviews, but in the hundreds of interviews, they ended up in two films. One is called Transcending Stuttering, The Inside Story, freely available on our website. You can go to schneiderspeech.com slash movies. And the second one, the sequel is Going With The Flow. The most important part of that is that in all these interviews, Rabbi Horowitz, nobody says as an adult that made it, you know what did it? I met the right therapist. They gave me the right tip. And ever since then, I put my tongue over here and my life changed forever. Everybody says, my mom. Get right out of here. Really? Yeah, some caring adult. And I want to, chokes me up, that's what you're doing right now. And that's what you did at 22. When a caring adult, and this is what I heard from other people who stutter in the conversation around Braden Harrington, who spoke at the DNC convention. You know, when you, when you become open about something that other people are holding in, and they think, oh, you're the teacher. You must have it all together. Oh, you're the successful contractor, businessman, accountant, construction worker, plumber, whatever. You've got your stuff together. When you can be open for someone earlier on in the path, younger in their years, it can change the entire world. And parents, you should know that as unprepared as you feel, time and time again, what Rabbi Harwood said about his mother ahead of her time, she didn't need to learn anything. She didn't need to read a book. To just listen to her heart and to be loving, unconditionally loving, and to try to open a line of communication around something. The only mistake we hosted the, Bering, the Harringtons, the parents, Owen and Jess, on Sunday, we had a parent meetup. We'll have another one September 13th. It's a free meetup for parents. We hosted uh, Braden, the teenager. And so parents asked, what's the right thing to do to push for kids to go to therapy, not to push the kids? So you brought it up. So I just want to share what they said, which was what your mother did. And it's a, not in any textbook. They, they made it clear that they listened to their heart. And no matter what a therapist said, some therapist said, I don't know, we did the assessment. He didn't stutter. I don't think he stutters. Well, he stutters. We he stutters. Get stuck. <laughs> we talk about it. I always tell people it's not an evaluation. If you come for a stuttering eval, you know that you stutter because no one makes that up. It's already khatum, it's already clear, stamped and approved. The question is, what do we do now? What's the next chapter? How do we find our way through this to help you get to say what you wanna say? So they said, you know, they didn't pay attention to that speech therapist. And they went on to find the people that were good understanding people and supportive people. But the idea was they let him lead. And they made it clear that they would get behind him, but it was his choice. And that power of choice. That's exactly what my mom did. Wow. You know, I saw when I said that, I, I, when I said that, I saw you nodding. Now I know what the nod was. I just, I'll, I, I can't, uh, I'll, I'll stop after this, but I just want to share with everybody. It says in the Torah, when God created man, he breathed into him the spirit, the wind, the, the power of, of Ruach. And 
Unclus translates this, uh, we say, as Ruach Memalala. This is the right. defining characteristic of a person. Right. And I spoke to a mother just before our call. She's asking me, can you explain to me what's going on with the stuttering? It's so confusing. It's so hard to understand that it is. It's so baffling because it's not always there. And and maybe we can get to that, Rabbi Harvitz, what you said, like, so you do stutter or you don't stutter. You overcame stuttering. This is a conversation. This mother wants to understand. I said, you know what? Before we understand stuttering, let's take a moment to understand how complex speech is. There's no other creature on the planet. <laughs> it is the defining thing. There's two things that define us. This is what the Kabbalah tells us, right? And speech, the power of speech, and the power of choice. Angels can't make choices. People can make choices. Animals can't make choices. They work on instinct. You put a, a thing of Ben and Jerry's in front of the right animal, they can't hold themselves back. Uh, and when it comes I have to a hard speech, time with that too. <laughs> listen, we all have the animal inside of us, but absolutely, speech is a defining characteristic. And uh, if anyone wants another Meyer Makam, the Ramchal and Kuras Hashem, Per Kafches, if you understand, uh, the Ramchal was brilliant, and he talks about Moshe and Moses and why and how could it be that Moses, who was the penultimate teacher and leader, why someone who stutters? And I hear from the rabbi, but beautiful essay there, but it's a delicate thing, speech. It's a very delicate thing because it's a sacred thing. It's a special thing. It's a defining thing. And that's why so it's so tender. So, so I, any I, I thoughts want, on that? Yeah, yeah so, so I, I before the Torah thoughts, I... Until, you know, I spoke about life until 22 and now and, and childhood. So I'll tell you what happened yeah. in between. So yeah, I, I taught eighth grade for 15 years. I taught Gemara most of the years. Whenever the school tracked the eighth grade, I always volunteered to the weakest track. And then in 1996, I had a really, until then I had a really, I had a nice quiet life like you see back there, you know, with <laughs> Just trees and no, I just, you know, I worked in school. I, I had an afternoon job as a general studies principal at a local school. Um, <clears throat> and then I wrote an article in the then Jewish Observer, the Agudah of Israel's paper called uh, An Ounce of Prevention. It's the only thing I ever wrote in my life. First thing I ever wrote. I did this for six months. I typed with 10 fingers one at a time. You know, I just like did this, punched out a very long piece, basically saying, look, we're losing a percentage of our kids to religion. It doesn't need to be this way. Here are some of the things we could do. And overnight, it just exploded. I, we got four or five hundred phone calls, three, four or five hundred phone calls to our home the first month. We got a hundred letters. Remember those? You know, wow. it was 1996. And I went, ultimately, I was invited to the Torah Masara convention. I go to Israel's convention and we spoke about teens of Rish, which was nobody, you know, it was, it wasn't something you spoke about. Following in your mother's footsteps ahead of the time. That's well, yeah, you wasn't talked about in polite company. And one thing led to another. I ultimately eventually moved to preventing these issues. You know, I'm doing a new website now. So I was thinking, you know, a little tagline. So I went through three or four iterations and I, j I came up with identify, advocate, prevent. Because that's really what I've done in my life. You know, identify, here's an issue, talk about it, it's real, we got to deal with it. And then eventually, as other people got involved in doing stuff, you know, and getting, getting on board, thankfully, then I slid over to preventing, which is the books you showed, you know, preventing mm -hmm. child abuse, preventing kids. I, I think the number one reason, educational reason, that children don't um, actualize in Judaic studies is because they, they're not being, I think much more attention needs to be taught to how to teach skills-based. Thank you. That's the beginning. So again, Talmud. Elu Metzias just came out for the very popular Thank popular you. chapter of the Talmud that uh, is often the first chapter, but the rabbis put out many books about uh, learning Gemara. Yeah, and it's all on Amazon. If you search it, Yaakov Horowitz, Bright Beginnings. Stushni has already put a comment. You can check it out. But if you go on Amazon and look for Rabbi Horowitz, but I want to say the other prevention book is teaching kids about how to stay safe. That couldn't be a more right. important and, topic. And there, there, it's also about how to stay safe from people they know. It's, you mentioned, thankfully, thank you for mentioning the good touching, bad touching. It's also about, yes. about identifying the personal space, how to, um, how to get the feeling of ownership over their personal space um, and feel that there's a sacred right that they have and notice when people uh, impinge on that. And we know that abusers brilliantly and in a very evil way slowly encroach. It's very rare that they just go abuse a child. They tend to break down 
that personal space over time. So we train children to notice when it happens and speak up. No, no secrets from parents, you know, training children to, to, if anybody tells you, keep this between us, immediately go to a parent and parents should encourage that. Um, like, as you said, good touching, bad touching, and no one has the right to make you feel uncomfortable. Um, but so you're back what, to your book and how you right. were, your first so essay. So I found myself when I started in 1996, here I was, a yeshiva guy, you know, no professional training in therapy or anything like that. And all of a sudden we were getting hundreds of people reaching out for help. And I'm very grateful. I was mentored by some really great people who, who I don't even know where they found the time uh, looking at their busy schedules now as an, you know, uh, as Dr. Abraham Tversky, the prolific writer uh, was, he mentored me. Anytime I called or emailed, he was immediately, I don't know how he did it. He was immediate, Dr. David Palkowitz, uh, you know, uh, uh, you, you beat me to it. I just wanted to suggest for people, if, if this is the first time you're hearing about this and you're in the community or you're outside the community, these are the names to turn to. These are people who right. have, have two feet in the community and in the Jewish community uh -huh. and Jewish wisdom, but also two feet firmly planted in professional credential yes. and, and experience and impact. David Pelkin, so when I went to that, this... and Rabbi, Rabbi Torsky, Abraham Torsky. So, so one, one of the things that was so profound about Dr. Torsky's mentorship um, was his humility and his candor, his bracing candor, um, which I also thought of, by the way, when I started there, mm. when I started on that Vayichan clip. Um, I, I contacted Dr. Twersky and I said, uh, Dr. Twersky, I, I would love to start writing. I wrote this article and I see, I never realized the power of the written word. Um, you know, this is before the internet and stuff. So I said, like, what's your advice? <laughs> God bless, God bless him. Hashem should give him many, many more decades of I mean, good health and, and, and share his wisdom with all of us. He wrote 80 books. He wrote, I don't know if you ever see his books on cartoons, on Charlie Brown cartoons, psychoanalyzing. He wrote together with Schultz. He, he has the, books you know, on recovery. He wrote with Schultz. He's written Jewish books. He, he's covered Torah the gamut books. of personal Torah books, but also very, very well-known books on sobriety and recovery and addiction. And so I said, Dr. Twersky, what do I need to know? I'm, I'd like to get into writing. On the spot, he says, Rabbi Yaakov, get used to rejection. <laughs> get used to rejection. He said, my first manuscript was rejected by 37 publishers. And I said, oh my God, like here is the quintessential, what you just said a few moments ago, here's the quintessential success story. You know, just, just shakes speeches out of his sleeve, right? And just effortlessly writes all these books and was able to do all of this stuff. And he said, you know, most of the things you're gonna try aren't gonna work, but keep at it. He says, you know, you, know, you have something to write. Just don't let anybody tell you no. And it took me so a while to young, a young person still kind of finding your way, finding your voice. And that message of confidence that he put in you really opened you up to pursue. Absolutely. And, and I, I, it's funny. He was at my, he's, he's well into his eighties now. Um, I just turned 61. So, you know, he was probably my age when I spoke to him and I was just some kid, some 35, five year old kid no one knew about. And I take that responsibility very seriously now. And when, when 30 year olds, 20 year olds or 15 year olds reach out, I really try to, to pass this on. Yeah, pay it forward. I, I just want to tell everybody if you're popping in now, what a treat it is. You get the replay uh, here on Facebook or you, you know, it'll be posted on our website, on the blog page, all these conversations. But uh, Rabbi Yaakov Horowitz is with us. And just to say how, how busy and involved in good things he is, I reached out immediately when he posted this video. He was very open about posting a video where he was preparing a lecture, a Torah lecture for an international audience. And he stuttered and he said to himself, I'm not going to white it out. I'm not going to edit it out. Um, I'm not going to airbrush it out. And I reached out and it took about a month for us to pull it together because he's such a a person who is really so involved. But I, I think the highlight there is not how busy he is, 
But for those of you out there that think that the big people, the leaders, the big names, the big writers, the big authors, the big politicians, what we see is they also have a heart. They also have a story. They've also overcome different challenges and things. And uh, very often they have an open ear and an open heart. And especially now, I think in these times of COVID-19 and different types of experiences we're going through, many people feeling very socially isolated, uh, feeling very alone. And that's probably the, the worst thing for anyone. And especially for people that have a tendency to go, to go into low places. But for all of us to remember, many people are stuck at home. Look at Rabbi Horowitz. He's not in his yeshiva. He's not in his base medrash. He's on his porch. So reach out, send emails. Where can people reach you if they want to reach out to your website or send a message? What's the best way to to, to get your books, to get your services, and to right. contact so, you. So it, it um, thebrightbeginnings.com, the T H E B R I G H T beginnings plural beginning with the S at the end. dot com. Stu, Stu on Rabbi Yaakov's team. Can you can you post that link if you don't mind in the yes, feed? Yes, and and the books the books are are are, are on Amazon. Um, I do have a very active. Thank you. That's the. The Talmud book, the the Chumash book, the Bible book, and and by the way, folks, all of those educational books are really for beginners. The, the idea basically is that I think you know that we need to spend a lot more time preparing kids yeah. for dis studying a different discipline, you know, different uh, uh, types of uh, areas of Judaic studies, rather than just drop them into it. Um, and, you know, I have a very active social, I have a YouTube page that has a lot, I just did a whole series of um, classes on, on Adelaide. If anybody's raising teenagers or preteens, I just, the first time I ever did this at this level of death, I did seven videos on, it's called a deep dive into raising tweens and teens. And um, did you see, uh, did you see them any chance? I see everything. Oh, it was okay. wonderful. It was transgenerational, wasn't it? Didn't you have someone as a special guest facilitating with you? Yes, my daughter. I have a boy. Very good. Our daughter. Yes. Um, she was. Yeah. It was, so was from your sick. from your mother to you to your daughter, truly paying it forward, truly passing she, it on. And she just, you know, we did a segment on. Um, I'm I'm a very firm believer that parents should try to create the environment where kids are comfortable talking to them about anything, and I I I did a talk at Mariah, a very prestigious uh, minor Orthodox Jewish school here a few, a few months ago after there was a scandal in the New York area about a, a faculty member, not in that school, but a different not school. Not in that school, but that the news broke, but just like any other community, someone and that was school, doing something. That, I might know the school that it happened to handle it perfectly, but they, they asked me from Mar at Mariah to speak to the kids. So I said, look, uh, the parents, I mean, so I said, look, I think, I think the best thing parents can do is to teach their children to talk to them about anything that particular situation was resolved because the teenager came to the parents and he had right. to basically admit that he was sending naked pictures of himself to what he thought was a young lady. Now imagine that right. conversation. Could you imagine a kid? Oh, by the way, uh, you know, I was saying- Hey mom, hey dad, yeah. Hey, yeah, so I, I said, so I said, if you don't know what it's like, I brought our daughter to Mariah, uh, mm. our youngest child, our married daughter. And I said, look, if I know it's hard, if you, if you haven't raised your children this way, it sounds kind of weird. They let your kids say anything you want to them. What happens when they tell you they did something wrong? How does it work? And so I said, Sarah, come on up. And she took questions. We took questions together. Oh, it, was, yeah. it was really, so that's why I did it here in the house. But that, that's the thing on teens. I did a number of talks on, on uh, but that was really like a deep dive into all areas of parenting. It's all free. It's on my YouTube page. And I'm active on social media, Facebook, yeah. uh, Twitter. Uh, um, LinkedIn and, and Instagram. It's all uh, Yaakov Horowitz. Um, I, I just want to make, it's it's not promotional and this wasn't planned. I just want to say that if you have a thought about the range and scope and being in touchness of uh, Orthodox rabbi, you'll be very refreshed to see the messages and the content uh, that Rabbi Yaakov Horowitz shares. And if you're someone who grew up in the community and, and doesn't longer feel comfortable in the community because of different messages that you got that didn't make you feel welcome. Again, if you're listening, if you're in my network and you're picking this up, Rabbi Yaakov Horowitz is a voice of, of a voice of listening, a voice of, of empathy and a voice of connection for many people who might otherwise not feel can welcome. I, can I just share one, one thought before we go? Please. Yeah, we're not uh, going anywhere. We're oh, not going anywhere. We oh, got another 10 minutes. We're good. Oh, good. Oh, we got a lot more to cover. We got a okay, lot to cover. Great. 
So I, I know you sent me some questions. I'll be glad to take those. But yeah, I, I just want to I really want to talk to the public at large um, who are, I hope many are listening and, and trying to think like, how do where do I fit in? Um, you know, th there's a, a lot of research on on bullying prevention and and how to stop cyberbullying and other forms of bullying. And and the research shows that programs that, you know, I looked into school programs, Dr. Rona Novik, by the way, from Yeshiva University is a rock star. She, she, she has a fantastic and a bullying prevention program. And I went for training and we were gonna institute it in our school. And I asked her, I said, what's the success rate? What does success look like? So she said, we hope that we can knock, the, knock it down 35%. I said, that's all? You know, I said, I thought you were gonna tell me, you know, we'll bring it down to nothing or next to nothing. So she said, the whole program is based on this. She said, a program will not stop a bully from bullying and it won't stop children who unfortunately, for one reason or another, are doing things that make them vulnerable to bullying to change that. What we address are the 95% the of people in the middle. She right. said, bullying stops when the people in the middle go over and stand with the victim. That's when it stops. That's when child sexual abuse stops. That's when, and I think to some smaller degree, um, stuttering is the same thing. So when, when this is the message folks to everybody who didn't experience stuttering, doesn't know anybody who's stuttering, you know, um, when you hear it happening um, and you wonder like, do I say something? Do I not say something? Do I do something? And you know, good people don't know what to do. I lost the head cover for one of my uh, drivers yesterday on the course. And I went back to look where it was, where it was, I left it, it wasn't there. And I was trying to like, what would be the right thing to do for someone who found it? You wouldn't know. Should I leave it there? Figuring the personal comeback, should I drop it in the office? Should I leave it at the golf cart station? So happened someone put it on a table in a reception area, okay? So people, same thing, like, you know, you're a human being, you're compassionate, you see someone who stuttered, what do I do? Should I say something? Make it more obvious that they stuttered? What would I want to do? So I'll tell you what I found, you know, the, in any area, someone struggling with addiction or anything like that, you watch people at recovery. I've been doing a lot of, I'd be volunteering my wife and I for a recovery retreats. Sometimes it's just a silent, put a hand on a shoulder, you know, just, it's okay. You know, um, I, I, I think, I think if you hear somebody stuttering in some way, just to convey a message of support, People understand intuitively when something is genuine. I think it was so beautiful what Vice President Biden did. I, I stood up, I, honest to goodness, I stood out of my chair when I saw that video. I stood mm -hmm. up and I, I applauded him for, for, for his humanity. And I think that what you mentioned about Moshe, uh, um, you asked for a total thought. And then I really would like to take the questions that some mm -hmm. of the questions from the parents opposed. Um, there's a beautiful verse from Rabbi Hutner Zatzal, who was uh, the Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshiva Chai in Berlin in Flappish for many years. And he said, it, the, the Pasuk says, Sheva Yipo Tzadik Bekam. A Tzadik, a righteous person, falls seven times and gets up. So um, Rabbi Hutner explained that the traditional understanding, like one of the beauties of Jewish texts is you can interpret it many different ways, right? So Sheva Yipo Tzadik Bekam. A righteous person falls seven times and he still gets up, which is wonderful. So Rabbi Hutner says, no. He became a tzaddik. He became righteous because he fell seven times and he got up. That's what made him righteous. I think, I think a prerequisite almost for great leadership is overcoming stuff because it makes you empathetic, hopefully, to people in any area. Moshe um, understood his, you know, his, his challenge. And that's what made him, I believe, that's what made him a great person. I think that that's the, the ultimate leadership quality is getting in a room of people and this kid comes over and says, I started as a kid, that, you know, with, with uh, Vice President Biden. And, you know, I never did a rope line like that. You know, I know a, a hundredth, a thousandth of that when I make the speech and some people come over and want to talk, right? 
I can't even imagine what it's like running from event to event like that and to stop and say, here's my number. I want to get in touch with you. And I just would say, this is not, this is nothing to do with politics. This is nothing not to do. This is, a, this is a successful adult who, who took the time at, to reach out. And I can tell you personally, we know three teenagers that regularly get phone calls, not from his press office, not from someone else, but from Joe Biden himself. Um, and I, I, I'm not taking that to, to, to only say, go Joe. I want to, and I think he would appreciate if we all said, what, what can we do for someone who may be isolated, whether it's with COVID isolation, elderly, uh, those who are fragile, those who don't have a network, or people who stutter, you know, the value of what Rabbi Horowitz did at 22 to be open. Um, what that does for people is just unbelievable, and it's a shining moment of humanity, and we need to have more moments like that. So there are a bunch of questions, please, um, and I thought it would be wonderful. Um, so it's, it's a known thing, let's say bar mitzvahs. So we have a lot of parents of a bar mitzvah boy. You said you grew up in Crown Heights. Um, Crown Heights, uh, Chabad, Lubavitch, Hasidim, very close to our heart. First time I put on tefillin was with Rabbi Groner and Rabbi Krinsky in 770. There's a wow. story there, which anyone that knows what I'm hinting to knows, but I'm not going to go there now. But uh, in their community at the bar mitzvah, the boy is expected to rehearse the mimer that he, that he knows. In other bar mitzvahs, uh, people give a pshetel. And even in, in, in communities that are not doing those things, there is the idea of the bar mitzvah speech or the bat mitzvah speech. Your 12-year-old your kid has a stutter. You don't want to put them through an unnecessary uh, experience of pressure. And on the other hand, you don't want to pass the buck and kind of like teach them that they can always bow out and avoid thoughts. What would you tell that parent? My first thought is, if they're going to a therapist, ask the therapist. That would be my first thought. Always go to a professional. Doesn't mean first you have thought. to listen to every. Doesn't What's mean you have second to listen. Thought? Second <laughs> thought is, ask your kid. Hmm. Ask the stutterer. Because... How would you? How would you suggest a parent have that comment? It's such a tender, as you said. It's so tender. You talked about other sensitive topics. How do you suggest? I, I, I that? would say. I would say the parents. In other. In other words, I, I would suggest. Uh, again, I don't really have a frame of reference Off for this. Cuff, this is just, just my gut. I would say that the parents should say, "What would you like to do? Would you?" And give them choices. Would you like? And sometimes when you give an open-ended question like that, the kids don't even know what to say. But give them choices. Would you like to pre-record something? Mm -hmm. um, and and that you can <laughs> they can do what I didn't do and edit it out. You know, uh, um, give them some choices. Would you like to not give a speech? Would you like to? Would you like to? Um, I had a, a student, not a stutterer, but one of my students in yeshiva did a PowerPoint presentation that is bar mitzvah for his bar mitzvah talk. Yeah. I thought it was adorable. Nothing to do with, kid didn't stutter, but he just wanted to, maybe, he wanted every Maybe he got the idea for my client. I'll give a shout out to Lazar. Uh, you know, he was a boy like you and me that couldn't sit still in his seat. And he also had a beautiful stutter. And uh, when it came time for his bar mitzvah, this was the question. And I said, well, first of all, there aren't only two rails. There's a third rail. Uh, that's number one. It's not do or don't. And involved him and give him the options. And he chose. He was at the time, YouTube had just come out. So he was doing vlogging. I had him talking video game tips. And then he'd come in the next week and he'd say, I got a bunch of likes. I said, how many? He said, like 20. I said, good. I did a good job clicking over and over, you know. Uh, <laughs> But, but finding a way for a kid to feel good about themselves, to feel like they're getting acknowledgement in whatever format that can be, obviously it's best if it's in a primary way, but secondary is not bad either. Anyway, he chose to make, because at the time he knew how, before Charlie Harari had Charlie Harari videos with the montage and the speaking and the sliding pictures, right. he did that for his bar mitzvah speech. And nobody said, wow, so good of you to like not have to give a speech. What people said was, now that was interesting. There you go. Now that That's it. was memorable. So sometimes right. when you get creative and you have that conversation, great things come out of it. Um, but I think what the, what Rabbi Harwood said, the idea of having the conversation, and I went through something in our family, a health issue, the importance of, of being okay with both outcomes, that it's not this is good and this is bad. Exactly. Give the speech as a win, this is a loss, but there's choice A, there's choice B. And there are upsides and downsides to both and having that conversation as parents, if you can right. prepare yourself for both eventualities being right. 
and let and let the children know. I say at the beginning, it's your show. It's not yeah. about us. We don't yeah. care. Whatever you Beautiful. choose, we're perfectly comfortable with. That's what that's what I would say. You know, they could print up whatever. There are so many different yeah. ideas. They so many do. ideas. Beautiful. Another question, uh, and this is a common one in our community, coming from Williamsburg, Brooklyn, from a from a Hasidish girl, nineteen years old. She's in the in being set up to be married and and in that portion of life, that parsha. Uh, very concerned how the matchmakers, the Shadchanim, are told about her, and should they be told that she stutters, and then how should they transmit that to the potential uh, suitor? Um, any thoughts on, on that delicate matter? Well, um, common practice among um, Shidduch, I'm not, I'm not that familiar with the Hasidic world, because truthfully, the Hasidic world has a different timetable in terms of you know how many what's car like how many dates or whatever meetings do they have before they get engaged but in the non-hasidic yeshiva world um if there are underlying medical issues or anything like that um typical um you know the typical approach to this is to inform after the second date now, I know stuttering is different because they might stutter on the date, but I'm saying in typically if someone has that certainly diabetes, certainly not waiting to get married. Oh, for sure, the cat out of the bag. Right. So in other words, the idea is like this: that sometimes, um, you know, we do believe in basher, which means that you know God's divine providence, match made in heaven, match made in yeah. heaven. Thank you. Um, so, so we don't want to crimp that out. Uh, yet it's not fair to wait on, you know, as the couple's about to get engaged, let's say the 10 dates are the standard or 15, let's say the range is between eight and 20 dates before a couple decides to get engaged. It's not fair that they should get romantically involved in a serious way and then say spring this on them. So typically that is the general practice is that after two dates, sometimes the parents will say something to the parents of the girl, you know, the boy, um, or the kids will say themselves. Um, so they get a chance to, you know, to, uh, to, to develop a, a, some sort of relationship, know they're compatible. And then, um, so I don't know how this where stuttering is different because you do get it right up front. Um, I'll, 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 I'll put in two cents. I please. think similar to it's the start of a new school year. So do you go up front and tell the teacher about whether it's stuttering or other things that are worthy to know, or you let the other person size up the relationship on their own and then inform them along the way? I don't think there's a right and a wrong. I right. think it really depends case by case, but I would say, and I would love to continue the conversation after today, what are some ways we can get proactive about for, for the gabbais in the shul to know who to give an aliyah to and how to approach that and asking to daven lead the services and for shiduchim, for matchmaking, I think it's very important how we tell the story. If we tell the story, look, listen, give my son a break. You know, did you notice he's <laughs> got a stutter, the poor kid? That's a really bad introduction. Right. Uh, let me tell the following story and then I'll leave, give you a chance to finish with a thought and then top of the hour, I want to let everybody get back to whatever they're doing. This is delicious and we should continue. This story stand, to standing me- Standing offer. Anytime you want me back, I'm on. We're on. Okay, tomorrow. Um, but we'll find the time that fits in your schedule. This story is going gonna, is gonna to really touch you, and I think a lot of people, and I think what Rabbi Horowitz demonstrates and exemplifies is if you're that kid who stutters, if you're that young person who stutters, and you are hiding, and you're not talking about it, or you're silently feeling frustrated, or not so silently feeling frustrated, there are people to talk to. There are role models and people that care. There are professionals. There are self-help communities. And there are books. Just want to make another plug for my friend Mo Mernick's book, The Gift of Stuttering, written as a memoir of a, of a Jewish man. And it's really something that the entire world could benefit from his journey. But to tell you the story. Guy comes to my father, a Hasidic fellow, and the parents come and it's after Passover. And he hasn't been there for two months. And they say, so doctor, do you think he's ready? My father says, ready for what? And this is like a, this is like a cultural way of talking. Do you think he's ready? Ready for what? Well, ready for shaduchim, ready for the matchmaking, ready for getting serious about marriage. My father said, I don't know. I'm a speech therapist. I'm not a matchmaker. I'm not a shaduchim. How would I know? 
So they said, you know, but with the speech, it's very important that everything be tucked in. Geshek should be. My father said, I don't know. Have you asked him? Turns to the boy, he says, listen, I haven't seen you. How are you feeling? He said, pretty good. He said, are you ready to enter that stage of life to get seriously involved and to, to go ahead into marriage? I'm not any more ready or less ready than my friends. I mean, I'm interested. I'm ready. I also think I have some trepidation like anyone else. My father says, All right. he, he says he's ready. They said, no, but doctor, you don't understand. There's a very special family we're talking to. And their daughter, she is, she's like a princess. They say about her, it's as if she's waiting for Moses to come down from Mount Sinai and sweep her <laughs> off her feet. So my dad says, hey, Moses I don't know it. much. I don't know much. I'm not from the Hasidic community, but sounds like a match made in heaven. She's waiting for Moses. His name is Moshe. Mo Moshe, Moses. He, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, the great stutter. leader, had a stutter. Your son has a stutter. Sounds good. They said, no, you don't understand. My father said, listen, I think I do understand. He turns to the boy. He says, listen, do you want to, do you stutter all the time? No, just sometimes it pops up here and there. Yeah, but you stutter sometimes, right? Yeah, sometimes, but not all the time. Would you want to be in a marriage with a woman that didn't know that you had this thing happen, that you had to hide it all the time? No way. Would you want to be in a marriage where your wife didn't tolerate it and gave you a hard time? No. Would you want to be married to a family that the family didn't know and you had to hide it or didn't? No. So my father said, look, I'm not Hasidic, but why don't you go? This was on Friday. The meeting was set up for Saturday night. My father said, why don't you go in? This sounds crazy. Why don't you go in there and just put it on the table? And this is what I'm saying about how you tell the story can change everything. Why don't you go in there, Moishi, and you tell the girl and the in-laws, whatever, future perspective, potential in-laws, look, um, you might notice that sometimes I get, I get stuck on a word or two. It's not, it's not a problem over here. Uh, it's not a problem over here. I'm ready to be a great husband, a great father, a great learner, a great earner. Um, if you have any questions, just ask me and take it from there. And it seemed like such a radical idea and the parents weren't sure and they go home. This boy never picked up the telephone, but on Sunday morning, my dad goes to the office and he has a voicemail and it's Maishi and he says, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov, Dr. Phil, you're invited. You're invited oh. to the Tanaim. And there he went to the Tanaim with the Rebbe, and he didn't exactly have his shrimal out, but uh, as in many parties and simchas, he found himself being pulled in by the family because ultimately, whether you're Jewish, whether you're Hasidic or you're not Hasidic, the hat bends this way, the hat bends that way, or you're not Jewish, we are all one fabric of humanity. Each of us have a different color and a different stripe and a different role to play. But there are certain things that are special to our community, and that's why it was special to have Rabbi Horowitz. But the lessons of stuttering are it's an equal opportunity provider. So um, it touches people from every walk of life, from every place in the world, and every socioeconomic class. And we all have what to learn from each other, mostly by listening. So I want to thank Rabbi Horowitz for this very sacred conversation. It should be the first of, of a few, and we'll talk offline. But if you want to reach Rabbi Horowitz, again, the website is thebrightbeginnings.com so that's I've plural thebrightbeginnings.com and, and sometimes it's really hard to get me so please apologize keep trying in be persistent just like stuttering that's the lesson that's it and uh keep going and if you want to reach us at schneiderspeech.com and this will be available for replay on our website later this week dr scott yaris on thursday morning and some very exciting over the weekend, Carl Coffey, board member of the NSA. He was on television with Braden Harrington. And we'll be putting out some of the videos we recorded of the meetings this weekend with Braden and his family. And of course, my good friend, Cody Packer from New Zealand. Can't wait to keep the conversation going. Thank you for the time, Rabbi Horowitz. Have a beautiful really day. Really delightful. Pleasure. Thank you so much. It was very inspiring. Shana Tova to everybody. Shana Tova. It should be written, sealed, signed, and delivered for a year of good news, good health, wealth, happiness, togetherness, and good news for a year. We never needed it more than now. Yep. Thank you very much. Be well. Ta-ta.